Okay guys, for time's sake, I'm just gonna jump in to working through the practice problems and review problems for module eight. I do want you to know that we left off in lecture right before friction, so make sure you read the last part of the module and understand what's going on. But let's go ahead and work through these practice problems. All right, so the first practice problem says, a construction worker drags a box across a floor. If the frictional force between the floor and the box is 12.2 newtons, how much work does friction do as a box moves 11.5 meters? So this is just a simple work is equal to the parallel force times the displacement, right? And so you just set up your formula. 12.2 newtons times 11.5 meters, and I got 1.40 times 10 to the second joules. Make sure you pay attention to your significant figures, okay? Number two, a 567 kilogram car is traveling down a hilly road. If the car is at the top of a 15.1 meter hill and is moving with a speed of 19.1 meters per second, what is the potential energy relative to the bottom of the hill? Question one. Question two, what is the kinetic energy? And question three, what is the total energy? Okay, so to calculate out the potential energy, we just use our formula, MGH, right here. So we plug in 567 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times 15.1 meters, and we get 8.4 times 10 to the fourth joules, right? Now, we do the same thing for kinetic energy. We use our formula one half mass times V squared. So we do one half times 567 kilograms times 19.1 meters per second squared. And I get 1.03 times 10 to the fifth joules. Now to get the total energy, that's just your potential energy plus your kinetic energy. It's the sum of the two. And when I add those together, I get 1.87 times 10 to the fifth joules. All right, moving on to question three. A roller coaster comes to a halt at the top of a 75 meter hill. If the car starts to road down the hill, what will its speed be when it reaches the top of the next hill? Question one, um, which is 40 meters high? I guess that's just one question really. Okay, so working through problem three. So when the roller coaster is at the top of the hill, it has no kinetic energy, right? It's not moving. So all of its energy at the top of the hill is potential. And since we know the height of the hill, you can, you can determine what that potential energy is. So MGH is mass times 9.8 meters per second squared times 75 meters, okay? This is also going to be the total energy that the car, ha car has, right? It has no kinetic energy at the top, so as a result, when the roller coaster reaches the top of the next hill, the total energy is still going to be this equation right here, right? So when it's at the next hill, it'll have both potential and kinetic energy. So let's calculate that, the potential energy at the next hill, mass times 9.8 meters per second squared times 40.0 meters. And the kinetic energy then, at that point, will be one half times the mass times V, v squared, right? So when we set these equal to each other, we can then take our first equation and then we can set it equal to our second equation plus the kinetic energy there. And the really convenient thing about doing it this way is then we, we don't have to know the mass. We can just, um, it cancels out on both sides, right? So then we can sol solve for our velocity. So we get one half V squared equals 9.8 meters per second squared times 75 meters minus 9.8 meters per second squared times 40.0 meters. And then when you multiply by two and then you take the square root, we get 26 meters per second is the answer to that problem. All right, question four. Question four, a car travels down a hilly road at the top of an 11.5 meter hill. It is traveling with a speed of 21.4 meters per second and the driver decides to let the car coast down the hill and up the next one. If the next hill is 5.1 meters high, how fast will the car be traveling at the top of the hill? All right, I worked it out right here. Problem four. 
This is really similar to the roller coaster problem we just did, right? But the car actually has some kinetic energy at the top of the hill. So we need to add potential energy and kinetic energy in order to get the total energy of the car. And since we know the height of the hill, we can get the potential energy, right? So potential energy equals MGH, which is mass times 9.8 meters per second squared times 11.5 meters. And we can get the kinetic energy, which is one half MV squared. So it'll be one half times the mass times 21.4 meters per second, and that'll be squared. So the total energy of the car, right, is going to be this plus this, right? So mass times 9.8 meters per second squared times 11.5 meters plus one half the mass times 21.4 meters per second, and that's gonna be squared. All right, since the car's coasting, the total energy is not gonna change. So as a result, when the car reaches the top of the next hill, the total energy is still gonna be that equation, right? And since we have the height of the hill, we can calculate the potential energy when the car gets there. So that's gonna be MGH, but the difference is gonna be this height right here, 5.1 meters. We also know um, the kinetic energy, one half mv squared. All right, so the sum of the potential and kinetic energies at the top of this hill, or any part of the journey really, must equal the original equation for the total energy. So you're gonna have a really long equation that you set equal to each other, but you're gonna have this up here. We have the mass times 9.8 meters per second squared times 11.5 meters plus one half the mass times 21 meters, uh, meters per second. You're gonna square that is equivalent to right here, mass times 9.8 meters per second squared times 5.1 meters plus one half mass times velocity squared. And then you're gonna cancel out all the unknown masses, right? and then minus it out, multiply that side by two, then you're gonna take the square root, and I got my V is 24 meters per second. So hopefully when you work that out, you're gonna get the same thing. Uh, let's move on to number five. It says, the mass of a pendulum is pulled up so that it is 45 centimeters above the point at which it hangs straight down, its equilibrium position. If it's released from this position, how fast will it be traveling when it reaches its equilibrium position? Okay, so when the pendulum's pulled up, it has potential energy. So relative to the equilibrium, um, the equilibrium position, the potential energy is gonna be mgh, so it's gonna be mass times 9.8 meters per second squared times 0 0.45 meters, all right. Then since it's stationary at this point, it has no kinetic energy, right? So um, this is also equal to the total energy at that point, right? So since it only has kinetic energy, then we, the total can't change, so the two energies are gonna be equal to each other, okay? So I'm gonna get mass times 9.8 times 0 0.45 meters, and I'm going to set it equal to the one-half mass times the velocity squared, and I'm gonna calculate out uh, cancel out my masses really. And then I'm gonna get my velocity is 3.0 meters per second. So at the equilibrium position, that's gonna be um, the speed that the mass has. All right, moving on to problem six. I need to turn it. All right, hopefully you can see this. A 124 gram block is shoved across the floor with initial speed of 3.1 meters per second. When the block finally comes to a halt, how much work has friction performed? Okay, so since the block stops, since it halts, all the energy has been removed by friction. So whatever energy it had when it started is equal to the kinetic energy. And since that's the original amount of energy the block had, that must all be removed by friction, right? In order to get it to stop. So that's what we calculate out. So kinetic energy equals one half mv squared. So it's gonna be one half times 0 0.124 kilograms times 3.1 meters per second squared. And I got 0 0.60 joules. And that's the answer. All right, problem seven. A 1.1 kilogram package is at the top of a 1.2 meter high slope. When the package slides to the bottom of the slope, its speed is 2.1 meters per second. How much work did friction do? Oops, sorry about that. 
Okay. Since the package is still at the top of the ramp, its total energy is the same as its potential energy, right? We've talked about this before. So the potential energy is just going to be the math MGH, right? So right here, 1.1 kilogram times 9.8 meters per second squared times 1.2 meters, and I get 13 joules. Okay. If friction weren't involved, how much total energy would the package have at the bottom of the hill? It would have 13 joules all of which would be that kinetic energy, okay? But since friction is working on the package, its total energy is gonna be less because it's slowing it down. So how much less? Well, you have the speed and the mass of the package, so you can calculate, calculate that out. Kinetic energy equals 1 half mv squared, so 1 half times 1.1 kilogram times 2.1 meter per second squared, and I get 2.4 joules, okay? Since the box has no potential energy at the bottom of the ramp, this energy is also its total energy, okay? So you're going from 13 joules to 2.4. So when I subtract it, I get 10.6, but because of sig figs, it's 11 joules, right? So friction did 11 joules of work. All right, number eight. A student gives a 534 gram book a hard shove across the table. If the coefficient of kinetic friction between the book and the table is 0 0.45 and the book's initial speed is 4.1 meters per second, how far will the book slide before coming to a halt? Okay. I hope my shadow is not causing issues. Okay. So when the student gives that book a shove, he's giving it kinetic energy, right? So that's what we're going to calculate out first. Um, so one half mv squared, right? So it's going to be one half times 0 0.0534 kilograms times 4.1 meters per second. You're going to score that. And I got 4.5 joules right here. Now the table's level, so you can ignore potential energy. The total energy of the book is going to be 4.5 joules, okay? In order to come to a halt, the book must lose all of that energy to friction. So it means the friction must do 4.5 joules of work, right? You've calculated that out. And since you know the coefficient for the kinetic friction, you can also calculate the force. So that's what we're doing right here. Force is equal to the coefficient. Okay, so we're going to get 0 0.45 times 0 0.534 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, and we get 2.4 newtons, okay? So now we know the work done and we know the force. Now we can calculate out the distance, right? We have that formula right here. So 4.5 joules is equivalent to 2.4 newtons times the distance. When you divide out, you get 1.9 meters. So the book is gonna slide 1.9 meters before coming to a halt. All right, number nine, a janitor pushes a box 11.1 meters across the floor in 2.40 minutes. If the janitor exerts 67 newtons of force to do the job, how much power has he exerted? Okay, so we didn't get to this in class, but power is work divided by time, right? Since we have the force and the distance, you can calculate out the work. So work is 67 newtons times 11.1 .1 meters. We get 740 joules. And then power is just gonna be this 740 joules divided by time, and we're gonna do seconds. So I needed to convert my 2.40 minutes into seconds, divided by 144 seconds, and I get 5.1 watts. And lastly, problem 10. Suppose you were able to convert the energy used by light bulbs into kinetic mechanical energy in order to move objects. If a 101 watt light bulb shown for 1.0 hours how much force could be generated over a distance of 25 meters? Okay, let me grab my page I worked this out on. Make sure you can see it. Okay, so we're given the wattage of the bulb and the time it burns. So you can use the equation, P is equivalent to delta W over delta T, right? So 101 watts is gonna be equivalent of delta W over seconds, and then I just converted my 1.0 hours into seconds, which is 3,600 seconds. I'm gonna divide that out. I get 3.6 times 10 
to the fifth joules. Yes, that's fifth. Okay, so now that we know how much work can be generated, um, we can get the force, right? So we have our equation. So we know that 3.6 times 10 to the fifth joules is equivalent to the force times um, the distance, 25 meters. And when we divide that out, we get 1.4 times 10 to the fourth newtons. So that amount of power can generate a force of 1.4 times 10 to the fourth newtons over the distance of 25 meters. All right, hopefully this was helpful. Let's talk about the review problems now. Okay, review questions for module eight. Number one, a secret agent is locked in a room. He pushes and pushes against the door, but cannot open it. Finally, he falls to the floor exhausted. Has he done any work on the door? Why or why not? The secret agent has done no work on the door. Why? Because no displacement has occurred, okay? Remember, work cannot occur without displacement. Number two, two men attempt to move a desk through the same displacement using the same magnitude force. The first ties a rope to the desk and pulls on it. Okay, so here, you have right here. The second, the second pushes. Which man will be able to do the most work? Refer to the diagram below. The man on the right is going to do more work because the force he's applying is parallel to the displacement, okay? The man on the left is going to waste the component of force, which is perpendicular to the displacement. Number three, which of the following are legitimate units for energy? All right, any unit, remember, that has a force unit times a distance unit is a legitimate energy unit. We talked about this in class. So the ones that are going to be legitimate are going to be inches, pounds, that's legitimate, and Newton kilometer, okay? Those are legitimate energy units. Number four, in each of the cases below, indicate whether the energy is kinetic or potential. Okay, A, um, the energy in a tank full of gasoline, that's going to be potential. B, and the energy in a car traveling down a road. That's gonna be kinetic, it's moving. C, the energy in electricity moving through a wire, kinetic. And D, the energy in a ripe apple hanging in a tree. That's gonna be potential. All right, um, number five. A rock is at rest on the top of a cliff. Suddenly, a small breeze pushes it off the cliff. Where is the potential energy the greatest? Where is kinetic energy the greatest? At what point in its fall is the kinetic energy equal to the, po the po sorry, potential energy? Okay, so the rock's potential energy is greatest when its height is the greatest. So at the very beginning of the fall, that's gonna be when the potential energy is the greatest. Its kinetic energy is the greatest when all of the potential energy has been converted to kinetic. So this occurs at the instant right before the rock hits the ground, okay? Since the rock's total energy is equal to its initial potential energy, it will have an equal amount of potential and kinetic energy when half of its initial potential energy has been converted to kinetic. And that is gonna happen halfway down, okay? Number six, when you lift a heavy box and place it on top of a table, you perform work on the box. After you put the box on the table, it remains stationary. We've already learned that when you work on an object, you either add or take away from its energy. In this case, did you add or take away from the energy of the box? Was it potential or kinetic energy? In lifting the box, you're working on it, right? As you raise it, you're increasing its potential energy. Once it's on the table, its kinetic energy has not changed, but its potential energy has increased. So you have added potential energy to the box. Okay, number seven. Two boxes slide down a level sidewalk. The first is heavier than the second. Other than that, they are identical. If they start with equal speeds, which will slide the furthest? All right, this is, this is a trick question, okay? They will each slide the same distance, okay? The frictional force is gonna be greater for that heavier box but it also has the greater kinetic energy. The increased frictional force is offset by the fact that friction must do more work to stop that heavier box. Since the work due to friction must equal the initial kinetic energy in order for the boxes to stop, the mass cancels, right? So it means each box travels the same distance before it stops. Really is a trick question there. Number eight, 
What's the difference between energy and power? Energy is the ability to do work, while power is a measure of how much work was done in a specific time interval. Know those definitions for terms for your test, okay? Number nine, two light bulbs are in two different lamps. Although they are both the same type of light bulb, the first is significantly dimmer than the second. Which light bulb consumes more power? The second light bulb is brighter, meaning it has a larger wattage, right? This means that the second bulb consumes more power. Number 10, which of the following are legitimate units for power? So remember, any energy unit divided by a time unit is a legitimate power unit, okay? So kilojoules per year is a legitimate power unit. Um, also, since watt is a power unit, any prefix to watt is also valid. So kilowatt is also going to be a valid. All right. I hope this was helpful for you guys. Let me know if you have any questions and good luck on your test. I'll see you Monday.